I'm Alex, software developer from Stoke-on-Trent, England, but I now reside in Switzerland, so I success successfully Brexited last year. <laughs> Previously, I spent some good time at the BBC working on the sport website and all the data services behind it. And also, I spent a year working with Juxt for Credit Suisse, and we did a lot, a lot of closure and closure script there, building a dashboard for traders. So, Exascale. We're a cloud provider, a European cloud provider for the moment, with data centers in Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. And we do all the things you'd expect from a cloud provider. All various types of virtual machines, object storage, and we have a real focus on data privacy. We're based in Lausanne, or at least most of us are based in Lausanne, Switzerland. So you've got the Alps to the south there, you've got Lake Geneva, and we're somewhere down by the lake. But we also have a lot of people all over the world, right? So London, America, France, Germany, Lithuania, Russia, and we even have remote devs in Switzerland too. So twice a year we meet up for an offsite where we do all the planning for the next three to six months. So this was just a few weeks ago in Chateau Bay in Switzerland. Anyway, so the product, or one of our products, is the client portal. And it looks something like this. So we have the, the key services we offer on the left-hand side, and then you can see some subsections under compute here, so VMs, firewalls, private networks. And this is the instance detail page. You can see all these little UI components. I'm currently editing this instance display name here. And the last screen I'll show you for now is elastic IP addresses, because this was one of the first screens we decided to rebuild. Um, this is actually just a single page. You've got zones along the top, and you've got IPs listed. When you click on an IP, it looks like the first one. It expands, then you can do further operations like associating it with a virtual machine or changing the DNS. Very, very simplified version of our architecture. Ignoring the whole platform on the right, we have an API gateway as far as the front end is concerned. We have a very thin Python layer that's serving the JavaScript and um, it's proxying API calls, and we have the JS running in the browser. So, what are the issues we face with the current app, okay? Because the UI looks reasonable, you click around, it's all pretty smooth, worked well, but it looks a little bit like this. So, this graph is showing you um, logarithmic, linear, and exponential lines, okay? And Many software projects, in my experience, tend to look like this red one, where they start off pretty well, we deliver features very quickly, and then over time it gets harder and harder to add new features, and we slow down. And for some cases it might be that actually there's no new features to add, right? The software's finished, and it's only a few bug fixes that happen. But in our case, that is definitely not true, right? We have loads and loads of features that we would like to add, loads we'd like to build, and the reality is we can't do the UI quick enough at present. So we look more like this red line. Ideally, we'd like to be more like the blue line, something linear. So over time, we're constantly delivering new features. And the exponential one, it's a nice dream, but really, unless software is writing software, that's not gonna happen, <laughs> right? Another problem we have is the tests. So it's not that we don't have any tests, we do, but they're mainly at the bottom of this pyramid. And we rely a lot on manual testing every time we do a release. And this is a big problem because the more features we add, the more there is to test, and ultimately we slow down. Problem number three, tooling. Okay, so we started back in 2013 with the most popular JS framework at the time, Angular, Angular 1, for those interested. And then it's a reasonable choice, right? A lot of people were building things in Angular back then, but then Perhaps six months, one year later, React comes along. But we are still with Angular. We bring in a few dependencies for downloading packages, Grunt for a bit of automation, Bootstrap, which along with it comes jQuery and a few UI components. And then before too long, <laughs> we've got everything, right? We've got them all. We tried everything. Um, functional programming becomes popular, so we're bringing in things like Lodash, underscore JS, and new versions of ES every year, and Babel to help us with that. But it's starting to look like something else from the shores of Lake Geneva now. 
So this is Frankenstein's monster, as I'm sure you're all aware. And ultimately, Frankenstein dies of exhaustion whilst trying to destroy his monster. So we don't want to suffer that fate. So to summarize, velocity, the speed at which we can add features, is a problem. Tests are a problem, certainly the ones towards the top of the pyramid where we're really lacking these. And the tooling is also causing us problems too, when we have to upgrade libraries or libraries are no longer maintained and we have to swap them for something else. So it's just slowing us down. So how do we go fast? And this is a quote from one of the founders of the Agile Manifesto. The higher the quality, the faster you go. The only way to go fast is to go well. Okay? And maybe that's not strictly true because we've seen, right, at the start of a project, even if we're not going well, we can deliver features, we can go pretty fast. But really, we can't do this at a sustainable pace. So how do we go more like that blue line on that graph I showed you earlier? How do we improve the quality? So tests I've spoken about. Fewer dependencies, so we have less things to maintain, less things to upgrade. Small focus libraries, by this I'm talking about something like Angular 1 really takes over your entire application. You're going to do things the Angular way. What we'd prefer is to have lots of small libraries working together, and if we're not happy with one of them, we should be able to swap it with something else without too much effort, really. So I don't need to sell closure to you, right? You've all drunk the Kool-Aid or the cider. Um, and fortunately, I don't need to sell it to our company either. So a lot of Exascale is built on closure, mainly because our CTO is very passionate about closure. So the, at Exascale, it's more like, why not closure instead of why closure? And you're all here today, so let's skip. So we had closure, right? We've solved the problem. <laughs> and you're going to tell me, right, you told me the dependencies were the problem, so why are you adding more of them? And it, it would be a valid point, right? If Frankenstein didn't kill us, this one definitely will. But sometimes things are going to have to get a little bit worse before they get better. But the general consensus is we have a plan, we know where we want to be. So, on to the implementation. The grand redesign in the sky, right? We made these mistakes in the past, we know what we're doing this time, this time we get it right. And think back to that Joe Armstrong tweet earlier. It's pretty much this, right? We start with a green field. Developer's dream, build whatever you want. But ultimately, it always ends up looking like this which is Battersea Power Station in the UK. And actually, it's being renovated at the moment. It will be the new headquarters for Apple at some stage when it's finished. Um, but our problem is a little bit different than this, right? Because that's an empty building. We have people living in our building whilst we're trying to renovate it. It's a bit more like this, which is a viaduct on the M6 in the UK. And supporting this is 150 different pillars. And back in 2002, they found a problem with one of the pillars. And as a result, for safety reasons, they had to replace bearings on every single pillar, which is a bit of a problem. It took three years, it cost over 50 million pounds, but they did do it in an agile way, right? They replaced it pillar by pillar. Traffic was down to one lane and significantly impacted, but it was done in an agile way. So we're a bit more like this, really. So, which do we pick? Do we go down the route and build something new, or do we try and migrate what we have? And you've seen the title of the talk, right? You know what we pick. Um, but the main reason for doing so is the risk that we see in working on a brand new project for nine months or 12 months, getting sort of 70 or 80% of the way there, and then actually priorities change at the company and we have to focus on developing the current app. Things get further out of sync and it gets canned, right? It's a big risk. So. We've decided we're going to migrate, but how can we do this? And there are many options, right? But the three main ones that we considered, I will talk about here. So the first two are all about routing based on the URL. So the idea that we either build a new app or we build, which could be a new app on the server, or we could build a new app and put it into the browser. And we route based on the URL here. So the third option is a bit different and it requires more interrupt. So it's really looking at UI components and trying to rebuild one component at a time. But, but with this comes the complexity of 
interacting with this monster that nobody wants to touch, right? So it's trade-offs, whatever we pick. In a bit more detail then, option number one might look like this. So we have this Python backend that's hosting a JavaScript app. We could build a Clojure backend with a Clojure script app and one by one migrate over to this, then eventually delete the top one. Um, it's appealing for a developer to do this because you start with some new new clean code base, something brand new, you do whatever you want. But for the user, actually, there's a significant impact because to do this nicely, we have to do page reloads. And for a single page app, you really don't want to be doing page reloads because instead of milliseconds to go from one screen to the next, you're talking seconds. And really, this rules out this option for us at this stage. We could do something like iframes, but that makes it even worse. So the second option is, again, based on the URL, but doing this in the browser. So we use the HTML5 history API. We have two routers listening to this API. And we migrate it one URL at a time. So we, we can rebuild one module per URL and eventually migrate from one app to the other. So it tends to look like this. This is quite appealing. It, in one way, we have to work with the existing code base that nobody really wants to work with, but it's inevitable that we have to do this anyway, right? Um, there's potentially some challenging interop and some collisions maybe between the two routers, but it's a reasonable option. The third one is to look at a much lower level, and here I've highlighted one component as JavaScript, one component as ClojureScript. You could imagine as just doing this Closure script component to start with, okay? And integrating this with the current app. But then, really, the problem comes down to rendering and how are we going to render this Closure script component inside the app? Do we export a library? We really don't want to do too much interop if we can get away with it. We'd rather do the minimal that helps us get moving and start delivering new features. So, what we actually pick is something in between options two and options three, right? We decide that option three, doing one component at a time, is a bit too involved. Even though it's more agile, it's probably gonna cause us problems, all of this interrupt. So we decide that we'll try and migrate the primary content based on the URL. We'll leave the navigation, the notification thing at the top of the screen there, and the details at the top right in JavaScript initially but we'll build the primary content in ClojureScript, and this big ClojureScript square here will either be ClojureScript or JavaScript, depending which URL you are on. In terms of how we implement that, it's fairly simple, because Angular has this ng-view component that will render based on the URL. The idea is we put a div above that, we bootstrap a ClojureScript app into this div, they both listen to the router, to the URL, to the history API, and they know which URLs they are responsible for rendering. So the concept is fairly simple. So to summarize, we'll bootstrap both apps, root with the history API, do some interrupt where we need to. So like that notification component at the top that we're leaving in JavaScript, we still have to call this from ClojureScript somehow. And at the bottom there, write UI tests against the JS app. So I said, tests were a problem. We don't really have any tests at the top of the pyramid yet. So the idea is we write tests against the existing implementation, swap it out with ClojureScript, and the test should pass, right? We're not trying to test every variation here because they're going to be too slow, but we're going to try and get some decent coverage from some UI tests. The new architecture then looks like this. So we still have the API gateway, the Python API, and we just have ClojureScript alongside JavaScript. In terms of our tests, so UI tests are really hard to write, but they're even harder to debug. So we decide that we will try and limit the scope of these UI tests, and we'll build a mock of the Platform Gateway API, and we'll use Selenium to drive tests in the browser. And there's a talk later on today, actually, that's about something similar to this, I think, where a different approach is taken, so I'm looking forward to that. But to summarize our UI tests, again, Selenium will create a mock and 
really the tests have to be independent of whether it's JavaScript or ClojureScript, right? Because this is key in order for us to switch between the two. And we decide that we will start with IP addresses as our first URL to implement. And in terms of architecture, it looks a bit like this. So we have this router. We have a controller that's listening to the router and deciding which view gets rendered based on this. We have a data layer which really represents the API calls that the app is making. But there's a bit more to it than this, right? As the initial release, we also need to do a little bit of interop for notifications, the component at the top of the screen. And we also need to do polling. And then you can imagine as we add more modules, there's probably going to be about 10 or 15 of these sections here where you've got instances, IP addresses, and more entities in the data layer. And the idea is that the data layer persists data across screen changes. So data that's shared across screens would not be loaded every time. We'd only load it when we needed to. So I'm going to talk about some of the libraries that we used, starting with Reagent. So essentially, it's wrapping React. It's giving us this nice hiccup-like syntax. Um, and it's giving us some good options for local state, which can be really useful for building small components. But the, the actual implementation is looking something like this. This is a very simplified version. The, the top component there is the most basic component you can do, really. Just a div with a heading tag in it. The example below is this idea that you have this delete button. You click on it, then you get an option to confirm or cancel. And it's using some local state to de determine which mode we are in. And we pass a callback for the actual action. So that's a way of just doing a simple reusable component in Reagent. Most of our state, however, though, will be managed with Reframe. And the idea here is it's similar to event sourcing, if anyone has done event sourcing here, where you have the state, and your state is really just built up from a series of different events. So we have, with Reframe, we have all the state in the database. We have some subscriptions, pulling certain bits of data out of that database. The view gets rendered based on the subscription. And then when we want to change something, either because a user is typing in a text field or they click a button, we dispatch an event, we update the DB, and we go around the whole process again. Um, this is the general idea. And there are many, many re-hyphen something libraries that go along with this if you want to use them. In terms of implementation, it starts to look like this. Um, I won't spend too much on this, because those of you who have used Reframe, you'll get the general idea anyway. And I think there's probably too much to try and explain it all today. But we have an event handler, we have a subscription, and then we have this view component at the bottom that has a subscribe and a dispatch in there. And this is just showing the whole flow. The other library that we spent, that is really useful and is a big part of our stack is Integrant because you can just build the UI in Reframe if you want, but the one thing you're really missing is dependency injection, okay? And Integrant gives us this nice ability to inject some dependencies like all those JavaScript callbacks and to keep them at the edge of our code base but it also means we can configure the system in different ways. So the basic implementation looks like this. This is a very cut down version of our system, but the key here is I'm passing a callback. So this JS window, JS API display notification, I'm passing this into the component, then I'm registering, registering an event handler inside this init function that's injecting that callback into the function that actually needs it. The other main use for Integrant at the moment is that initially we'll start with primary content only, but we want to be able to do different configurations of the app that include the top navigation bar and eventually everything in ClojureScript. And the reason we want various implementations of this system is that when migrating over, actually for some tests we might want to mock out the JavaScript parts in Clojure, 
because the downside of testing this all as a whole is that we need to spin up the Python app, we need the JavaScript build, we need the Clojure script build, and it's very difficult to do this in parallel. Um, but if we mock out some of the JavaScript parts, we reduce the scope of some of these tests, and it, it gives us a lot more power. But using integrant to do this, or component, or mount, whichever one you want to use, the, the concept is the same, really. Um, and yeah, this is another example of is just mocking the very top component. And probably my favorite of the library so far is write it, if I pronounce that correctly. Thank you. Rated. Rated. There we go. <laughs> Kitos. <laughs> so this is a bidirectional router, which means given the URL, you can work out the name of the root. Given the name of the root and the parameters, you can work out the URL. But the best bit is adding data to roots. And we use this a lot, right? So we define roots in CLJC, and then we can use the same roots in the client or on the server. So our tests use the roots on the server. Um, our stubs and mocks also use these roots. And on the client, we attach data for different ways. A very cut down version of our app roots looks something like this. It's just data, it's just nested vectors. Really simple syntax. And in terms of adding data, so if you look at the keywords here, these are the root names. We actually add data when we instantiate the router with this expand function. And we use this for things like view. So we have a function that is used to determine which view is rendered. And we can keep all of this as config rather than hard coding this in our code, which is really nice. Um, we also change things like polling frequencies. So by default, we poll every three minutes or five minutes. But if you're on that section, we might poll every 10 or 15 seconds instead. So what did we learn along the way? This has come up a few times already today, but um, small functions, right? It's better to have... 100 functions operate on one data structure than 10 functions on 10 data structures. It's a quote that, it's quoted in SICP, it's actually from another book. But In our case, this actually looks a little bit like the reframe DB, right? We've got one data structure with everything in there. Um, but we did hit problems with performance. So initially our subscriptions and our components were probably too big. And this meant that instead of just re-rendering the one element on the page that we wanted to re-render, we ended up re-rendering the entire list in some cases. So by keeping things small, this really helped. Um, and if you've not used it, React Developer Tools is great for this, right? This option to highlight updates will show you exactly what is rendering when you click on things or when you type. And it's really useful, and you should definitely do this if you're doing reagent apps, even if you're not using Reframe. The next lesson is namespace keywords. So a lot of the tutorials out there for Reframe don't show namespace keywords from the start, right? Um, and for a small app, you can probably get away without doing it. But for something like our use case, we ended up with, a, you can end up with a very deeply nested database um, because the database structure actually looks a little bit like the navigation on the left-hand side. We had compute initially, then we had instances, IPs on the compute, and then further data below this. And it got to five or six levels deep pretty quickly. Um, so we swapped this out and we used namespace keywords instead. The other thing that is very easy to do with Reframe is circular dependencies. If you're just using regular keywords, or even if you're using fully qualified keywords like this portal.data.ip slash list, it will let you do circular runtime dependencies. And if you, if you have this, and we had it in places, really it highlights the design problem with the code. Um, actually importing the namespace and doing namespace keywords, it, it, you can't even do this from the start then. So it's a much better option. This is our database, or at least part of it. So I wanted to show you the namespace keywords here and why they're important. So 
all these portal.data ones, I've highlighted portal, portal.data instance in green. This is data that we persist across URL changes, right? This is data we keep. Pretty much everything else apart from the router gets cleared when the URL changes. So we really tr try and use this to separate what we call transient state, state that should change on URL changes, from state that needs to persist. And namespace keywords give us a nice way of doing that. They also give us a nice way of looking at the database. We know exactly where that bit of data sh should be written and read. So it's something like encapsulation, but it's not true encapsulation. This is another example of namespace keywords in an event handler. And the idea is generally the same. It makes code quite easy to navigate because we know exactly where to go and look for that notification info event handler. Right? We just go to the notification namespace. So, encapsulation. Sorry to do this to you, but <laughs> Java 101, right? <laughs> Horrible, isn't it? Um, we have this private string name, but why do we have that if we look back? Um, we have it because, and this is a particularly bad example, <laughs> as with many Java examples, um, but really say I can't pick a better example for, to explain it today. We have encapsulation here because if we want to change name, we can do it within this class and we can do it safely without breaking our code elsewhere. That's the idea instead of just making it public. Um, but we actually lose a lot of this with something like reframe because all of our state is in one big place. Anyone can read and write to it. And it's quite easy to forget actually when you've done closure for a while, it, it's easy to forget why we had encapsulation in the first place. An example here, and this is something we actually did, right, because we used to use Biddy for routing, but we switched over to write it about a month ago. And what we had is we had this root in the database, and we were reading from this in many places in the code. And then when I wanted to change the router, I then realized, ah, I've got to go through and change all of the code here to make this work. And that's a problem, right? We shouldn't have to do that. I should be able to do this all in the router namespace. So the way we do this now, we don't necessarily do it for absolutely everything, but for bits that we know we're going to be needing across the whole UI, which the router is definitely one, we try and do, do functions on the namespace itself and to force some ownership of this. So here we're extracting this root data name. We extract this in a function in the router namespace. We could do exactly the same thing in this other namespace down here, because we have the DB, right? It's just a map. We could do router slash root and go and access it directly here. But this breaks encapsulation. And this is what causes us problems later on when we come to refactor this. Another thing, embrace JOS interop. So I said at the start, we wanted to do minimal JavaScript interop if we could, right? We knew we were going to have to do some, but we weren't keen on doing it. Um, but it worked out surprisingly well. And the way we did this, right, we exported a JavaScript API from the JavaScript app. We exported a ClojureScript API from the ClojureScript app. So the JavaScript one looks something like this. Um, a lot of it is cut out, but essentially we just put this object as a, as a global, and we expose a few functions on here that dispatch Redux events. Redux is very similar to Reframe, really, in the JavaScript world. And we have the same in Clojure, right? We just use export, and we can export the function, and we can call it from JavaScript. And the concept is the same as well, right? Instead of dispatching a Redux event, we dispatch a Reframe event. And the usages are listed here. Um, so in the most part, you just call things like standard closure script functions. When you're calling closure script from JavaScript, <coughs> our app is called Portal. So anything that you export gets put on this Portal namespace. Um, but window.portal would also work. 
And at the bottom here, if you want to actually send data structures across instead of just simple things like strings or ints, then you can convert from ClojureScript to JavaScript and vice versa. Model data is maps, right? This is not just a um, closure script or a reframe thing. Um, I'd say this is good practice wherever you're doing closure. So especially lists, right? For a list of things, we could just use vectors or lists. Um, but by modeling as maps, it's much easier to actually get into the data. So let's have a look at an example. The first one, I've got a very simple vector with two maps in there. and to find, the thi to find the bit of data that I want, I have to filter, then use first. An alternative, I could do this with sum, but it's the same thing really. I'm looking for something in a list. If we do this as a map instead, I can just use get in, a sock in, update in. It's far easier to get to that data. And if I actually want a list, I can just use vals. Okay, don't reframe all the things. So, we like reframe. It, we found it really useful in our app, um, but it doesn't fit. It doesn't. It's not the solution for everything, right? And we don't want it to be. We don't want to reframe our entire application and rely only on reframe, um, because if something better comes along than reframe, we might want to swap reframe for something else. So we're always thinking when we bring in a library, how would we do it without this library? And the other key thing about reframe for us is that performance and reusable components. So we did notice some performance problems. If you, for example, if you're updating a text field with reframe and it's going through this entire loop every time, you might notice that some characters get lost as you're typing. And you, you can work around this by using things like dispatch sync instead of dispatch. But Actually, uh, we found that a, lot bet a better way of doing this in a lot of cases was to use some local state. Use local state for something like a text field and then dispatch an event when we actually want to save this bit of text at the end. Um, and it, it was a lot simpler to implement that way as well. Um, we also found that reusable components became a bit of a problem with reframe because you're reliant on doing these event handlers and your code is actually consisting of a few parts, the event handler, the subscription, and the view. And really, you've got to do things the reframe way. You could pass in keywords and namespace based on this, um, but really we found that in some cases, local state is actually better for this. So, if we if we look back now when we consider what went well with the project so far, because we're not finished yet, right? We're about 60 or 70% of the way through. And we have, we still have some code in Angular, but we have a lot of the core code now in ClojureScript. And if we look back at that initial graph, we're actually getting more, more like the blue line now. We're delivering new features. Um, there's still more that we need to go back and rewrite in order to get rid of all the JavaScript, but we've unblocked ourselves essentially, and we can start working on new features and delivering things in a nice way. The decision to do one URL at a time, I think also worked out pretty well, um, as did the JavaScript interop. But things we can improve, right? So where we did JavaScript interop, it worked well, but actually we could have done a lot more of this at the start in hindsight. We were, we were probably quite afraid of just integrating too much with the code that was there, but the more time we spend with it actually, the easier this became, as is always the case. So again, next time we would probably do more interrupt from the start. And reusable components I've spoken a little bit about already. But if we could change one thing, then really it would be this data layer. So the initial release is here, and there's quite a lot of, in this initial release. Even though we're only doing a single URL of this app, we've got to think about routing, we've got to think about the controller, we've got to think about the different views and models, getting the data from the API, how we model that data, writing specs for the data. 
we've got to think about polling. We've also got to think about, and this is something we didn't really consider enough at first, that when you've got one screen in ClojureScript and the rest of the app as JavaScript, when we make a change in this ClojureScript screen, so for example, we add an IP address, when we go back to the instances screen and we try and allocate that IP address to an instance, we need to make sure that we've reloaded the list of IP addresses in the JavaScript app. So essentially, both apps are doing their own API calls. We have duplicate API calls going on here. And we also need to trigger updates from one app to the other to make sure they stay relatively in sync. So if we were doing it again, I would probably do this from the start, right? Rather than trying to rebuild everything, we can save ourselves a lot of work in the initial release by sharing the data layer with the JavaScript app. And in hindsight, that is definitely what I would do. Eventually, we would write it in ClojureScript, but if we'd have done this, we would have reduced the amount of work we needed to do at the start drastically, because we don't need to do the API calls, we don't need to do the polling and the different configurations of polling. So, that's it. Um, thank you for listening. I, I hope this has been useful. And I will take questions after this too. Um, but before this, we have some vouchers to give away for anyone who wants to try Exascale. And Chris will be putting them on the tables outside now. Um, on the voucher, there is a link on the back of the card. So we don't actually, usually we don't publicize that we are doing um, free credit on Exascale and trials. So if you want to use this, make sure you use the register link on the back of the card, not just Google Exascale and sign up. Um, Exascale.com. So I will also be doing a blog series about this as well, because there's many parts of this presentation that I've not had a chance to go into detail in. But I'm sure a lot of it, where I've done one or two slides, I could write an entire blog post about this and probably still not cover it fully. But yeah, thank you for listening.